So very much wildfires and wildfire ecology is a big part of my job and not just um, kind of what some other people do with it, addressing it, but also finding solutions for it and what to do after a wildfire comes through. So I'll be touching on the restoration aspects of it as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, well then we can go ahead and get started um, and you can go ahead and share your screen. And if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat and then at the end, we can go ahead and answer those questions. Perfect. Um, so yeah, the topic of today's talk, um, my talk today will be wildfire ecology. Um, reminder, hey, Luis? work for American Forests. Yes. Um, I think I'm having a hard time. Oh, perfect. I got your, your screens up. Thank you. Oh, got it. Is there a little bit of lag maybe? Yes, I think just the bandwidth is a little low, but you should be good now. Gotcha. Cool. Perfect. So yeah, subject of my uh, talk today is wildfire ecology. Um, the Northern California Forestation Manager work for American Forests. A little bit about American Forests. American Forests is a national nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Um, they work on all things related to the health and um, climate healthiness of uh, America's forests. Um, so both, that includes both what we call rural landscapes. So these are like the traditional national forests, out kind of wildlands type forests, but then also urban forests as well. Um, the forests that are in our backyards or around our neighborhoods. Um, and then we have a lot of significant focus and work on those forests too, and how they relate to healthy communities and environments as well. So at the top, um, you have a kind of a good model of kind of the before and after, and we'll kind of work on the middle too. On the left, you have a forest landscape that hasn't been touched by wildfire in probably over 50 years. Um, you have significant brush growth underneath. Um, the trees are very densely clumped. And then on the top right, you have an area that has seen wildfire, and that one approximately six years back. Um, and that has also has been reforested. So you can see a lot of young trees in the middle. And that's kind of where this talk will go today. We'll be from a forest that hasn't seen wildfire to a forest that has seen wildfire, but has been restored and has been brought back on the right track. There we go. So just for a sense of scale, um, it's hard to kind of fathom sometimes the sizes that these wildfires are. Um, especially in the news where acres are just thrown around um, and sometimes without context. So for context, um, I got four different land sizes here. We have Manhattan Island at 14,000 acres, the city of Sacramento, just sort of about above 60. The 2014 King Fire, which will be one of the main wildfires I'll be talking about um, today, which actually nowadays doesn't make it to a mega fire. A mega fire was a new term that started coming up and gaining prominence about a couple years ago. And that was um, due to the rise of wildfires that were just disproportionately huge. Um, so back in 2014, the King Fire was actually a very newsworthy, noteworthy fire, nearly reaching 100,000 acres. But in 2020 and in 2021, we had wildfires in California that reached over a million acres and over across the U.S. too. Hence the need for mega fire, um, which is a wildfire uh, over 100,000 acres. And then also there's uh, an emerging new term. Thankfully, haven't had to use it the last two wildfire seasons around, but that's a gigafire where a wildfire that reaches over a million acres. So nowadays, the 2014 King Fire at 97,000, nearly 100,000 acres, isn't even considered a megafire anymore. But back in that day, it was considered very huge. And then we have Lake Tahoe for reference. Anyone who's seen Lake Tahoe knows that it's a good kind of frame. You can see across the whole lake. So it's a good area to judge size and whatnot. So we'll take a closer look. So Manhattan and all of these images are at the same scale. So about 35 miles up from above. So pretend we're 35 miles above Manhattan Island. We have the city of Sacramento, which is a little bit bigger. This is the King Fire at the exact same scale. It's the brown area in the middle here. Um, this is actually a really unique visual that you can see. Um, you can change on Google Earth when the date is of the satellite imagery. So I set this one to 2015. This one happened in 2014. So it's just a few months after the wildfire. So you can see the forested areas around and then the red dark patch of just dead 
matter and dead forests that it is to King Fire. It started from the southwest at the bottom left of the screen and worked its way to the northeast, which is the top right. And Lake Tahoe. Um, you can see King Fire is actually longer than Lake Tahoe, but not quite the same area as, as the lake itself, but very comparable in size. And nowadays, keep in mind that the King Fire is now unfortunately considered a small fire in the grand scheme of things. So this, this is a graph that's become pretty popular um, in, in certain wildfire circles, and it shows just how much wildfires in terms of acreage cumulatively has grown over the last 20 years. So you have over the last 20 years, you know, starting at around 500,000 acres, and this is the total amount of acres across every wildfire um, just for California um, per year. So in 2000, the year 2000, there was just under 500,000 acres of wildfires burned across all wildfires that burned throughout that fire season. And you can see it, it's slowly kind of been increasing. It kind of goes down. It's very, it's loosely correlated with high water years. Um, so 2011 was a very high water year. Um, and then during drought years, obviously when we don't get a lot of precipitation, then you do have the increase and you do Loosely correlated. Los precipitación eh, ven que eh, de una manera así no tan específica, pero que de, de alguna manera hubieron más incendios cuando hubo menos agua. Eh, y después en el 20. Last year, um, and you saw some increases there as well, particularly the, the notable year being 2020, where we hit over 4 million acres. Um, that was the year where one of the fires alone was a million acres. That was the Mendocino complex or the August fire along the coast range of California. So this shows that the amount of acreage over the last 20 years is definitely increasing. It's not just the news. Um, and we are seeing a definite rise in wildfires, but this just shows overall acreage and it just goes back 20 years. Um, there's a deeper story here if you look into it a little bit further, or should I say if we zoom out. So on the left, we have acres burned in the U.S. from 1926 to 2020. And this is for the entire U.S., not just California. And you could see in the early 1900s, 1926, 29, 32, it was massive. There's a huge amount of acreage just burning across the U.S. And then it decreases through the 40s into the 50s, 60s, 70s, it stays really low, 80s, and then into the 2000s, you find start seeing a little bit of an increase. Fortunately, this one ends at 2019, we'll probably see another bump there and as we go into 2023. Um, but what that's saying is that part of the responsibility for why we're seeing large wildfires today is due to human suppression. So the forests of California and much of the Western US, many forests are essentially every force, but to varying degrees, um, have evolved and grown with fire. Trees have no natural predators. At least that's the assumption. But in fact, fire is their natural predator. And they can overcrowd and they can overpopulate. And so they've developed and evolved a healthy relationship with wildfire so that, so that the trees don't overpopulate, they don't crowd each other out. We have wildfire coming in as the natural predator. And the trees have... Uh, are need this for a healthy overall forest. Um, when I first started getting into forestry, it always kind of baffled me. Like, why do trees drop all their needles and all their pine cones every year and just create the most flammable uh, forest ground imaginable? And in in, during the height of wildfire season, it's actually a tool firefighters use to see um, how dry the ground is. You know, if the needles desiccate that come from pine trees that are a lot of these forests and they just bend with the slightest break. And that just shows you how dry they are. If you put any sort of flame near a pine needle that's been on the ground and it's in August or late early fall, then that thing's just gonna light up. Same thing with a pine cone, a desiccated pine cone. It's almost like a little mini grenade that'll just send sparks everywhere. So these trees, I thought to myself when I was young in my forestry career, that supposedly fire is a bad thing for, why are they doing this and dropping these and essentially making fire like you know inevitable it's because they grew they evolved with it they grew for it good fire um which is what a lot of was happening in the early 1920s 
is when a wildfire comes, it doesn't torch up the whole, the whole tree. The forest, when it's healthy, can keep a fire low on the ground and it'll keep it from going up to the bigger trees. Um, the bigger trees have really thick bark. Some of their bark is up to a foot thick and that thick bark prevents the tree from actually dying when a wildfire hits it. The smaller trees, which are much more numerous than the bigger trees, don't have that same level of protection. Their bark is very thin. And so when a wildfire comes through those, it takes those out. So what, what fire did was it took out the small trees and left the big trees. And that kept the forest healthy because there's you're always going to have a lot more smaller trees than you are going to have bigger trees but the bigger trees are going to be the more hardy the more resilient um, the ones with the thicker bark that can withstand multiple years of fire and you can see this actually we've seen this in the tree ring the dendrochronology as that science is called of looking at the previous history counting the rings on the tree and seeing where there's ash layers or burnt layers and you could see a fire return interval frequency, as it's called. So how often a wildfire used to come back in historical forests was on the order of 10 years. Every 10 year, a forest would see a fire that would essentially clean it up and bring it back. But um, that it was a little bit of an antithesis, taking wildfire, taking small trees and living big trees to what we were focused on back in the day, which was logging which is when we as humans, you know, for production and economics and scales of economics would like to take the big trees, but leave the small trees. And so we had a very, there was a, a broad campaign um, everywhere on fire suppression. So with fire suppression, that's where we did not allow any of these wildfires to happen. So that's a big part of what you see with the fires going down from the twenties into the mid century, the 1900s was this, huge campaign and albeit very successful a campaign of fire suppression and so what that resulted in was you no longer had the forest's natural predator wildfire coming in and taking out the small trees leaving the healthy ones so you eventually all the small trees did end up growing they had nothing taking them out and you have overcrowded forests um, and then that obviously was not sustainable um, especially when you depart from the fire return interval frequency, the, the rate that every wildfire, that wildfire should be coming in in a healthy forest from 10 years to now multiple decades, that's going to have consequences. And that's a little bit of what we're seeing of a lot of what we're seeing of actually now is that rebound in it because the forest, when it's overcrowded, when it's not dominated by big trees and it's dominated by small trees that don't have that fire resilience, don't have that protection. They don't survive all of a sudden a fire that they would have a hundred years ago. They just all torch up. Um, and so that's that's in part a big part of what we're seeing the rise in, in the acreage and wildfires now today is that forests have lost that natural relationship that they had with wildfires over 100 years ago and now are no longer adapted. Um, they're misaligned with the fire return interval, interval that should be happening. And you're seeing these large landscape level high severity wildfires that I'll showcase next. So I've mentioned high severity wildfire. This visual from this study shows it pretty well. Um, on the very top at A, where it says moderate percent canopy cover, high severity mild wildfire is a percentage of how much are trees that are lost. So if you have a thin forest and you go to just one or two trees, um, I generally have always understood it as over 90% loss of forest. So as you see in A, you have a moderate dense forest that goes to two trees then that, that's high severity. But it can also be if you have a high percentage, so you know the crowded forest that we have today um, go into a low severity as well. So another example that is also high severity wildfire is when you lose most of the forest. Uh, moderate severity, which is a good type of fire, um, is when a forest only loses parts of it, essentially wildfire being that pre playing that predator role again where it takes out some of the smaller trees, leaves some more hardy, resilient, thicker bark, big ones, and you have a, still a forest remaining. So the overall arching conclusion is that high severity wildfire is when you lose a forest when you previously had one, while moderate severity fire, you still have a forest. And then there's also low severity fire where it's essentially less than moderate severity fire where you still have definitely have a forest um, that's remaining after the wildfire comes. And in a single wildfire, you will have all three of these. You'll have high severity, moderate severity, and low severity. So of the three, obviously high severity is the one that concerns us the most. That's the one where you lose a forest. But if you lose a forest, 
can't the forest just come back? Um, not always. This study in 2016 um, on post-fire vegetation showed and highlighted kind of the urgency and the threat that high severity wildfire poses. So on the very far left, we have an initial condition fire. And then on the top with the red arrow, if you go up, you have a high severity. So the forest goes away. Um, what we found is that since wildfire, since the forests of the, for, of, of the past aren't used to, they had, they, they're not, they're not, um, they haven't evolved to handle high severity wildfire. The good wildfire, um, the past was moderate or low severity that took out the, the smaller trees left the big ones. High severity wildfire takes out everything. The forest never adapted to that. That's never how they grew. So then you have the high severity and what we're seeing, what this study showed is that you have what comes back, a shrub blanket. Um, now shrubs are native to California and they've always composed about 30 to 40% of even forested landscapes. But you have, what, what we're seeing is an ecological type conversion, fancy word for, we're changing from one ecology to the other permanently. And so when a high severity wildfire to a forest that isn't evolved to handle it takes place, we see that ecological type conversion into just a shrubland. And these shrubs, um, I mean, they, they are native, they're good plants, they, they are nitrogen fixers for the soil, but in, in the forests and with trees, it's all a competition for light. And so they'll grow about four to five feet tall and cover the ground. Um, and that is enough for trees not to grow back because um, they, they start off as small seedlings, just a couple inches big. So even if there was seeds in the seed bank, which usually there isn't when a high severity fire passes through because it burns the seed bank in the soil, um, even if there was that, the, the trees lose the competition for light to these bigger, rapidly growing shrubs at a rate that they have never experienced before. And so you've seen then the permanent loss of forests through that aspect, through that ecological type conversion. And to throw it all even more, to throw another loop into it, the shrubs burn at high severity again when they do burn. And fire, wildfires is a win, not an if here in West, the Western US. So when do those shrubs do burn again, it's high severity. So it just restarts again, back to high severity, the shrubs come back. It's a positive feedback loop, essentially that the forest or what was once a landscape that had a forest gets stuck in. And that's what we're seeing as the permanent loss of forest. Moderate and low severity do not do this because you still have trees that are standing that are alive. And just like trees lose the competition for light when they're young to shrubs, shrubs lose the competition to, of light to trees when trees are big. And so those trees shade out some of the shrubs creating enough areas for, for it to start growing again as a forest. So fire exclusion return interval, I kind of already touched on this, but um, this is, and this example here is a good example of an area that a forest that has been, hasn't seen fire in a long, long time. And that has kind of grown way too dense and way too thick. Um, and so that's, that's the result of it. Um, this is measured in trees per acre. An acre is a measure of surface area. And so in amount of surface area, historically, and per one acre, there was about 30 to 40 trees. <clears throat> in this picture, and in this forest that just did some work in just recently, um, we have over a thousand trees per acre. So that's how much the forests have become overcrowded and essentially how departed they are from the former fire return interval frequency. So this is the effects of fire exclusion. Um, and if we are to return forests back to their normal densities when they had a positive relationship with wildfires, it's going to take a lot of work, <laughs> essentially. Um, and there's numerous ways to get there. Um, you can get there through being, bringing back fire on the landscape. Um, so that's through prescribed fires, as you may have heard, or forest thinning as well. Or um, sometimes fire does it eventually inevitably as well, as you'll see. So coming back to the King Fire, um, this is kind of the main fire topic for this talk. Um, this is in north, northern, northeastern California. We got Sacramento about 30 minutes to the left or to the west, and then Lake Tahoe to the right or to the east. Um, so right in the middle, the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada. So keep in mind, that's the general shape. We'll look at some of the more complex, colorful pictures of the King Fire. This is what's called a fire progression map. So wildfires, what they tend to do is 
grow rapidly during periods of intent, high intensity and then grow slowly as well. So you can see at the very bottom, you have a blue area that then becomes light green to darker green. That's how the fire started and each color changes one day. So the fire originally was just, you know, a, a several hundred to several thousand acres eventually, but it mostly stayed down there. Then the yellow, that bright yellow was all one day. And one day the fire grew by over 50% of its overall size. Um, that was a 40, 50,000 acre run that the Noad fire did in just one day. And coincidentally, that's where most of the high severity patches for this wildfire took place was in those areas of high growth, high intensity um, that you can see here as well. The red is the high severity, the green's low severity, and the orange is the moderate severity. So it matches really well with how it grew. Um, and these are through for a variety of reasons. One is um, in the and this one actually very, um, very well shows it that in the Sierra Nevada, um, you have winds coming from the southwest and they go to the northeast. So wildfires um, here in these areas and many areas are wind driven. So where you have big wind events, um, which we sometimes do in the fall here in California, wind events being times of the year where high winds just take place. Um, we have something called the north winds as well, where Nevada, where you have a lot of high pressure there, a lot of high heat um, will sometimes spill over across the mountains into California, and that's called a north wind event. Um, or you can have, you know, it's, it's the similar concept, but in just different localities, same thing as you may have heard, the Santa Ana winds or the Diablo winds, um, the same kind of process he's taking place, but also leads to the same type of wildfire dangers when a wildfire is taking place and it catches that wind and it can ride it as well. And if there's a forest that hasn't seen wildfire in a long time, um, it's all just going to burn up and as it did here. A severity map. Um, what we've been seeing, the King Fire was about 40% high severity. So there was a lot of moderate and low severity, which was good. Um, it's not all bleak. Um, the high severity isn't the the, the only percentage that takes place in most wildfires. Um, you have a distribution between the three, but the areas of high severity are areas of focus for restoration. Here's a visual of how high severity wildfire looks like. Note too that, notice how all these trees, former trees that are now dead um, are about the same size. They're really dense and they're you know, they're the same height and they're almost kind of spread out evenly as well. That's classic of a uh, overgrown forest, a forest that doesn't have a resilience to wildfire. A resilient old forest would have multiple density, multiple heights and sizes of trees so that, you know, small trees go, big trees stay. Um, and it would have much larger gaps too, wouldn't be as dense as what this is here. And then you can see um, on the ground, the shrub coming back first before any seedlings. And so you're starting that, that e positive feedback loop of ecological type conversion already taking place. Moderate severity fire, um, it's kind of hard to tell, um, but if you look up towards the top of the trees there, you can see a lot of those trees are still alive, um, even though they may be burnt. So here you, you have some bigger trees. So they did a little bit better during the wildfire. And it, it's not just always because of the trees too. Um, sometimes just topography just lends itself better to not being high severity or vice versa. And so there's, there's an intricacy of reasons as to why a fire may be high severity in some areas, but in moderate severity in others. Um, but here you do have a lot of trees that survived. Um, so that's, that's good news. This is actually probably did brought it back down closer to the densities that wildfires used to be at, or um, the forests of uh, yesteryear used to be at. And then a low severity fire, oftentimes you can't even tell it came through here. A lot of times the low severity fire just stays on the ground. It doesn't climb the trees, doesn't torch up the trees. And so that just cleans the vegetation. Those dry needles that I was talking about, the pine cones and whatnot, all that gets burnt up. And so that, that becomes part, that's all engulfed in a low severity fire but the, the trees themselves remain relatively unscathed. So high severity wildfire, when it's at the landscape level is, is detrimental. Um, this is an area where you can see there's, there's been, so there is some reforestation and restoration that took place here. And I'll dive into the specifics of that in a bit, but 
you can see the shrub blankets kind of surrounding that square in the background there. That's areas where if there's no treatment, nothing's done, then the forest remains like that, um, or the former forest. There's, there's not even a tree around to provide seeds in this area, especially in the middle of a large high severity patch. Um, so most conifer seeds only survive a couple of years in, in the ground in the so-called natural seed bank. So if you lose those couple of years, then you even if the trees, the seeds did survive, they're, they're no longer viable after that period of time. So you have that, you're starting to see, you do see that, that shrub cycle ecological, ecological type conversion taking place here. But the area that was cleared out in the background um, was areas that was cleared out with the intention of reforestation. And again, harping on, here's another good example. You can see the hills in the background. That's untouched areas about six to eight years after wildfire. You see that shrub blanket, break blanket in the background. I've trudged through a lot of that. Um, there, there are no trees. It's, it's all shrubs. It's, it's definitely what some would call bushwhacking <laughs> through those areas. Um, a lot of it is ceanothus, manzanita, and deer brush. Um, and then the snags there. And then what we're standing in, though, is an area that was cleared out and uh, prepped for reforestation. This is the main area that we're looking into that big patch of yellow where the fire grew in one day. Um, and this is what's called the Rubicon Canyon. Um, this area, why it, it, it burned at high severity was primarily because it was a canyon. So winds in canyons flow up canyon. So that's essentially what happened here. The winds took it once the fire reached the canyon and got down in there. And that canyon winds just supercharged the fire to the Northeast. And in its wake left this high severity burnt landscape. And then it's also important to note that these forests aren't just the home of trees, they're the home of our water supply. So what this, what I've done here is I've run a system where it filters out for just intermittent and per, um, perennial streams. So these are streams that never go dry theoretically or partially go, only go dry during um, the driest part of the year. And that's that's of note because most streams are ephemeral. So this is not missing most streams. Most streams only are active and from the winter to about midsummer, and then they dry up until the next precipitation event occurs. So these are the most important streams of all the streams there. You can see they all feed into Folsom Reservoir down at the bottom, big, big major water storage area. Um, so all this covers the areas that the wildfire take, and any wildfire in the forested landscape takes in. And so this is our own watershed, our own water supply that is being affected. And then not to forget the soil as well. Um, soil is an important part of any forest and any any just any vegetation environment as well. And you could see in the ignoring most of the horizons just at the top, the O horizon stands for organic horizon. And that's the small area where you have a bunch of needles. It's also called a duff layer, dying vegetation. Then you have the A horizon. The A horizon is that what you would call black soil um, that's rich in decomposed organic matter. That's where, as you can see from the image, most plants have their roots in. Most plants are getting all their nutrients from that A horizon. Both the O and A horizon are severely affected during high severity wildfires um, specifically. So that's the areas that are lost the most. And then so then you just are left with E horizon and below, which is also sometimes referred to as mineral soil or soil without organic components. And here's a good visual of that as well. Um, so on the left, you have that bare mineral soil with no organic component. And then on the right, you have a soil that does have organic component. It's got that darker matter, decaying matter in there, and that's what creates a healthy soil. So you're losing soil quality and soil and soil um, and soil health uh, during these mega wildfire events too. And then that all cascades down to rippling effects. Um, there are many road networks in these forests, um, some of which we all use to access our favorite trails. And when the soil becomes unstable, um, because that A horizon has roots and the roots will go past A horizon into mineral soil, and that all holds the landscape level down. That vegetation is holding cliffs and mountains together. When that's lost, um, we see a lot of landslides, we see a lot of debris flows, a lot of roads that are affected. Um, 
because you have that loss of organic component and the loss of vegetation, specifically trees too. Um, you may, one may think that a conifer tree may have roots that go really deep, but they actually just have roots that go really wide. Some of the biggest conifer trees may only go down 10 to 14 feet, but then go across hundreds of yards. And so that does wonders for soil stability, land um, slope stability, and whatnot. And when that's lost, um, you do regularly commonly see a lot of debris flow, a lot of landslides and wildfires. Makes it a challenge too. Um, this personal story this past year um, in uh, my own reforestation project, um, we had about, about half a million trees were about to plant. And then and, and this was scheduled for March, April air time. Um, but in February, we learned that this very road here had slid down about eight feet. So all of a sudden, our main access road to our planting sites, we was shifted down. And so we weren't sure anymore if we were going to make it. So it was, it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a fun, fun um, obstacle to go around, but we did end up smoothing it out and we were able to make it across. But there was a while where we might have lost a road and the, the wildfire again strikes again and keeps us from doing our reforestation work. <laughs> So yeah, let's dive on to um, some more happy stuff, reforestation. Um, this is the reforestation pipeline as it's called in my organization, American Forests. And it's where you take a broad look. Um, it's also, um, my boss likes to call it capital R. So this is where reforestation is not just planting trees in the ground. It's a long-term process that starts with seed. So getting the seeds for the trees and then growing them in nurseries, then that's another multiple year project. And then finally, you're able to plant it. But then after planting, it's not just plant and leave, it's plant and then monitor, plant and make sure and learn, you know, how your project went, so that future reforestation projects are more successful. And then looking, zooming in a little bit on the what it's called out planting here, the actual planting part, um, there's even more steps. Um, so there's the site prep. So that's where you remove some of the shrubs, um, you reduce some of the fuels so that these young trees that you're going to plant that, and as I mentioned before, young trees don't have wildfire resilience, any resistance to wildfires so that they're protected. So that when the next wildfire does inevitably come, it's not just all wiped away. And then you plant them and then you have short-term management, which is monitoring for health, um, maybe coming back and releasing or removing some of the shrubs and maybe coming back with it again so that they're, they're given a chance. And then long-term management. Um, the eventual goal is to bring back wildfire onto these landscapes um, to realign forests with their prehistoric fire interval frequency. So it's, it's, this is actually an area that's still being studied pretty intensely and being experimented with. But at approximately 10 to 20 years after a planting, once the trees have grown slightly thick enough, um, it does start becoming safe to start returning wildfires back into the landscape. And you will see some loss of trees, but that's natural, that's normal. But more, most importantly, that's the beginning of a restarting of healthy forests. These are seedlings at a nursery. Um, they grow them in a lot of times in containers, styrofoam containers, like the one you see on the left. Then once it's time to reforest, they pluck those out of there, put them in the bags, store them in boxes, and they get sent to their planting locations. Um, they are also, these are called container seedlings. There do also exist bare root seedlings. So those seedlings are, um, uh, are not sown in containers. They're kind of, they're sown in a field. So kind of what you would think of more on an agricultural setting. And in the field, once it's getting close time to reforest, they're they're picked up by this machine um, and then those are put into bags and they're called bare root because when they come out of the ground, it's just a root. It doesn't have that plug of soil like these container seedlings do. And so they're, those are bundled up into bundles of 50 and put into bags as well. Both are important pieces and both have their pros and cons in reforestation and their purposes of where to go, where they go. Shrub control, um, big part of all this checking myself on time. Um, big part of all this is if you plant trees there, the shrub, they're going to compete with the shrubs and a lot of them are not, if not most, um, or all <laughs> are not going to make it. So shrub control is a big part. And you could do this through a variety of ways. 
Um, one is with ground crews coming in and hacking and removing vegetation. Another is with those same ground crews coming in with a very, very weak herbicide that just takes out the shrubs as well in just certain spots. And then once that takes place, you can plant um, and you give the trees a surviving chance. And here we have a variety of trees, um, some of the examples. So we plant similar to what the forest was before. So on the right, we have a dug fir makes up about 10 to 15%. Ponderosa pine makes up about the bulk of it, about 50 to 60%. Sugar pine, about 20 to 30, sometimes 40%, depending on location. And then actually in a lot of parts now, even outside, we're planting giant sequoia of their natural range. Theoretically, we still are in the natural range here. Um, we have giant sequoia to the north of us in the last stand, their most northerly stand, which is called the Placer Big Tree Stand or the Northern Septinals, um, which are actually, it's an interesting um, concept, idea that they're there just because there's four or five old growth giant sequoias, but then they're about a hundred miles north with their next closest stand um, down at Calaveras Big Trees. And then obviously you get into Sequoia National Park. Um, but a lot of these have their own purposes and their strengths. Doug fir, which is the one on the right, does really well in canyons, moist areas, north slopes, shaded areas, cooler areas. Ponderosa pine, sugar pine, they do well in really sunny areas. So the areas where Doug fir wouldn't do so well, those two do do well, um, and vice versa. Uh, Ponderosa pine likes it when it's a little more exposed, while sometimes Doug fir may like a little more competition, a little more shade. And then giant sequoia, um, we're seeing is similar to Ponderosa and that it likes kind of the more very exposed areas, um, no shade around and allowed to just kind of grow large and big. Planting crews um, are the ones who uh, plant the trees. Um, they come in crews of about 10 to 15. This past year, I actually had two crews. I had so many trees. Um, one crew of about 10 to 15 uh, people can do about about 10,000 trees per day. Um, they, on, in those two bags they have there, they'll fit on anywhere between 200 to 400 trees. They can fit more if they're bare roots or just lighter, they don't have all that soil attached, or it'll be less if it's containers, just because they have the soil on there, it's a lot heavier. Um, and the most common technique is a hoedad. Um, this tool is kind of it's kind of like a scythe but for the ground. One strike down in the ground, they open the soil up, grab a tree from their bag, put it in, and then close the soil back up and then onto the next. Um, I counted it once and timed them and they do about six to seven trees per minute. Um, we'll see if this video works. Oop. So that's a container. A lot of the soil in particular is rocky. So he had to use more, more force to make a, a bigger, better hole. And he's on to the next one. Um, and they work in crews. These guys are true professionals. Um, they keep at marching and moving at a way where they're in a consistent pattern, where they're always approximately 12 to 15 feet, feet away from the next guy. Um, and that keeps them organized so that not too many trees are planted in certain areas or not too little trees are planted in certain areas. And you kind of got this even landscape. And then that is something we do play around and experiment with too, is the pacing, the spacing, I should say, of how the trees go into ground too. So sometimes we do want more trees in a certain area, or sometimes we want less. Um, and that's also something that I've had the joy of working with these crews and trying to experiment with and coming up with new no novel approaches. And then long-term management, um, which is the eventual goal, bringing back fire to these forests, but then also um, monitoring, which I'm doing on the right there, and keeping track of seeds, seeing how they're growing, um, seeing where they're surviving and where they're not. Site selection. Um, so as I mentioned and kind of hinted at before, certain trees do better on north slopes, certain trees do better on south slopes. That's because it's set the sun, for those who don't know, um, is slightly to the south here in the northern hemisphere. And so southern slopes are always going to have more sunlight exposure, especially during the summer, than northern slopes. And so 
that's um that makes a big difference actually in the vegetation and forest ecology uh you have the northern slopes that because of that are are cooler generally have moisture soils and whatnot so they're gonna be better for a different mix of species um compared to a south facing slope same thing with a west slope too um an idea that, you know sun sets in the west so it's the strongest during the later part of the day when it's facing the west um so west slopes are gonna attract and be beneficial for a certain species mix compared to an east slope. <clears throat> and so we have, this is done on GIS where we can filter out all the areas where we, um, based on their slope aspect or where it's facing, and that would help us guide us into, hmm, maybe we should plant more dug fir on this east or north slope. And definitely we should plant more ponderosa or sugar pine or giant sequoia on this south slope. And then different species have different strengths um, in terms of fire sensitivity. Ponderosa pine is really good. And it's just a small sample of species. They're not all the species we plant, not all the species that exist. But just for example, um, ponderosa pine is good, whereas maybe incense cedar has a better drought tolerance than ponderosa does. Or temperature sensitivity with climate change, we know temperatures are going to be higher into the future. Incense cedar does really good with that. Ponderosa pine, or well, maybe a fir doesn't as well. And then I hinted earlier, um, we may experiment with the spacing too. So it's just not always um, a grid-like format that we plant in. We do plant in what's called clusters. And this is to mimic um, what the forests of before used to look like when they had a big fire return interval frequency. Um, this is still very hypothetical. Um, and there's we actually have many studies here in these parts where they're looking at just answering this and what Implication, implications changing the spacing does. Um, we actually help plant about through four or five of those plots that that is part of a long-term study on this um, to answer this question. But yeah, the idea is um, it comes from analogy from the Cien, San Pedro de Mar Sierra Madre de Martir forest in Baja, California. There, um, they have never had fire suppression in those forests. And they're, they're loosely close, they're close enough to the forests of the Sierra Nevada where you can make some comparisons. So in Baja, California, where you the wildfires have just been allowed to burn, no, there's been no suppression tactics on them, then in those areas, um, you see this hetero heterogeneity is what it's called, or this variable spacing, clumps and clusters kind of everywhere is how the trees are growing there with when, when they're aligned with fire. And so that's what we're trying to replicate and mimic at an early age here with this type of spacing. And then an important, what was used to be kind of forgotten aspect of all this is we need seeds to do all that level of reforestation. So I mentioned this past winter, um, we planted over 500,000 trees. Um, where does the seed come for all of that? Um, there are seed orchards around, but a lot of it also does come from wild collections. So we go out in the wild to where forest still exists and we climb those trees um, and with the goal and intention of collecting the cones on there before they fall and capturing those seeds to then deliver to a seed bank. It's actually just doing this yesterday. <laughs> um, so this is for sugar pine. Um, and it is, this is a very, very delicate process in terms of um, it's very easy to miss or get wrong. So cones on a tree are a two year process. They start the first year on most pines in this area as a cone let. So it's kind of a small baby cone. And then the next year they become, they grow into the full large cone. Um, cones, you, ha you can't collect them until the seed inside, the embryo inside the seed is fully developed. And that doesn't take place until about, it changes every year. This year it started taking place a couple weeks ago. Um, so very end of August um, and early September. Uh, but in previous years, it's been mid-August or even early August, or in other years, it's been late September. It varies um, on a variety of factors, but one of the most, the most important factors I've noticed is temperature. So last year, we had a big heat wave in August that really accelerated the maturity of a lot of the cones, and so we were collecting a lot earlier. This year, um, we had a relatively cool summer. And so that prolonged cone collection. In fact, I could probably still be collecting today. Um, I was just collecting yesterday um, as well because that cooling factor slowed down the maturation process of the seeds within. And so once the embryo and the seeds fully developed, you only have 
about two weeks, likely less, depending on if it, there's a, a heat wave that comes in, that you have to, uh, time to collect the cones before they naturally just open and then the seeds just naturally release. And then you're collecting empty cones at that point. So you missed your collection window. So it's very time sensitive. A lot of times um, I have climbers on contract that, that cones are ready tomorrow. You, you're around and, um, and we're, we're doing it the next day. Um, so it's a very, very timely process. Um, they're long days in the field, but it's only this time of year. And it's, again, very easy to miss, but it's a very important aspect of it. Um, so, for example, for this area, the, the recent years of reforestation, we've actually run out of certain species like incense cedar, um, just incense cedar right now, but we're running low on other species as well. And that's a situation where we don't want to be in with more wildfires down the pipeline and more wildfires that um, need to be reforested that have already happened. So we need to keep the seed bank replenished. And this is a very important aspect of it as well. And then um, I'd like to wrap it up kind of with this, what we can expect restoration to look like after several years. So this is one year post wildfire. Um, this area hasn't been reforested and you can see it's, you know, this is obviously a high severity wildfire. It's just been nuked. There's, there's no vegetation in sight. The wildfire just ran clean through here. Three years post reforestation. So not post wildfire, but post whenever you start doing reforestation or restoration, um, this is what you kind of look like. So the trees that you saw in that one picture, they're only a few inches tall when they come from their container or bare root. Um, but in about three years, you know, they, they're growing almost close to two feet tall if they're doing really well. 30 years, um, you start looking at a forest. Um, these trees, you know, by no means are the tallest trees around. A lot of these are 15 feet, 20 feet, um, and relatively small um, comparatively, and still haven't built up their full resilience to wildfire. But this is, um, you know, on the time, we're working on time scale of trees, uh, not our own time scale. So 30 years, this is a 30 year old wildfire. Um, this one burned in 1992, a little bit more upslope from the King Fire, and it had an intensive reforestation program that took place afterwards. This is what it looks like now. And then 60 years post reforestation. So then you definitely start, you know, getting a recognizable forest. Um, you start seeing big trees. Maybe you've had one or two or three or multiple wildfires or prescribed burns take place. And then you see, you start seeing the good impacts of that. You know, I see a few dead stumps there, whether that's from a prescribed burn or from the original wildfire, it's hard to tell. I've would likely say it's from a prescribed burn because it's a stump and that kind of material would degrade 60 years post wildfire. So this is eventually kind of close to the goal and you, you're starting to see different levels and different sizes of trees as well. You see, you have that cedar out there that's about mid height and then you have some taller trees around. Um, so it's hope, um, but we're, we're working on the timeline of the trees. So that's all I got. Um, thank you everyone. And that's my old email. It's now lv.all at americanforest.org. Wow, Luis, what an incredible and informative presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we can go ahead and get started with our first one, which is from Shauna. Um, can you explain a little more about how the loss of trees changes the water cycle? Yes, good question. Um, so it will impact the water cycle in several ways um, that kind of work against and with each other. One is um, right after wildfire, you have a, a loss of vegetation. So that's a loss of water uptake and a loss of water that you're losing to viable transpiration. So you actually have more water um, now in a watershed post wildfire just because the plants aren't taking it. But that, wild, that water nowhere to go and being in larger quantities will essentially erode that landscape and pick up a lot more sediment. And that's, that's one of the biggest threats from wildfires into our water quality and our water storage systems um, is all that high sedimentation buildup that comes after a wildfire. 
and that causes, you know, it's also causes and works with debris and comes from debris flows, landslides and whatnot. And all that sedimentation is not good for reservoirs. It's not good for water quality. Um, and it's not good for the environments where they're eroding, um, precluding the reestablishment of organic soil as well. So it implicates the wildfire in, in weird ways in that it does increase the amount of water available in that landscape um, prior to the, after the wildfire, but it does so in a detrimental way. Very interesting. Um, thank you for that answer. We have another question. How has climate change affected the science and practice of reforestation? Yeah, very good. Um, so reforestation is by no means new, um, but a lot of the historical reforestation, a lot of the research tied up with it as well, related to post-logging reforestation. So reforestation after a logging company would come in, clear land, take all the trees. And then obviously it's not good for good business as well to just leave that as, as, as is. So you'd want to go and reforest that and then return it back to merchantable sized timber. Um, but nowadays we're dealing with reforestation post wildfire, which is a whole different, there's a, it's, it's, it's entirely different. The soil's different, the ecology is different, um, and the situation and the initial disturbance is different as well. So that's where there is a big research gap. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions in terms of how to do this well and how to do this right. And I'm glad to say that I'm part of um, helping and supporting a lot of those research to answer those questions of, um, how that is how that is changing but that's the biggest change and the biggest kind of knowledge gap that we've ex experienced in this field is that change from post logging reforestation that you know we used to know and have have done really well to now it's a shift to those post wildfire reforestation very interesting um we have another question in the chat how do botanists save seeds from the seed bank especially before or after a wildfire event and how can or could you or would you recommend steps that the community can take to save seeds, especially from critically endangered or threatened plants or trees? Yeah, good question. Um, so the seed bank, um, I, I can understand how there might have been a little bit of confusion. There's seed bank naturally in the soil um, that you, you know, belongs to the soil that you're not taking out. Um, and when a wildfire comes, it's taking it out or not, and maybe the next trees of tomorrow. But there's the seed bank we have in nurseries. And so that seed bank, that's where they get their seeds from the, the cone collection process that I just showed, um, where we collect cones from the tree, deliver those cones to the seed bank, and then the seed bank will extract the seeds from the cones. And it's the nursery, I should say, will extract the seeds from the cones and then store that in a seed bank. And so um, this is all done in anticipation of wildfire. So, uh, you know, in an ideal world, nurseries are fully stocked with seeds of the certain areas. Um, and when a wildfire comes through, you know, they're, we got your back, we got seeds here. But we've learned um, and kind of have raised the alarm that nurseries don't actually have that much seeds in their seed bank now um, for a variety of reasons. There's a big workforce capacity gap when it comes to collecting cones and cone collection and bringing seeds back to the to the nurseries for cone um, for seed bank storage. So that's where um, that's where the most important part is is in that wild cone collection. So we need people out in the woods surveying trees with binoculars is the most common way to do it for cones, catching them with the timing is right before they open up, but as the seeds have already matured and collecting them and then taking them to seed banks. Um, so that's that's the biggest way. If you have a species that you're, you know, that you feel is threatened, you would prioritize cone collection for those before a wildfire comes. Um, and then how can I recommend steps uh, the community can take? So I have, I'm a big supporter of the community being involved in all of these projects. Uh, all these projects and aspects and all these steps of reforestation. So um, we actually just started it this year. So uh, three years ago, I started a community science monitoring program. Um, so I had volunteers sign up from the local community. They had go up to these landscapes and do monitoring on the reforestation. Very simple. Um, and that was actually pretty successful the first two years. So this year, um, we held an additional day for some of the more devoted volunteers. Um, it was open to anyone, but it was, it was a, a whole extra field day. So the, the, the people who came were extra devoted. Um, and we taught them how to survey for cones, just because for this whole area, there's just two of us. And we're like, we can't do this alone, uh, me and my assistant. So um, we, uh, we trained some volunteers 
And they actually found, they, they got so good at that, still into it, that it was very easy for them afterwards that, you know, they're on their hiking trail on a weekend and using the skills they learn, oh, look, that tree has a lot of cones. So, you know, somewhere that me and my assistant would have never planned a thing to survey. And they see it, they find it, they report it to us via an app. And then we actually collected about half of our cone collection this year from volunteers, uh, from our own community science volunteers who found those trees and stands for us. So um, at, that is, you know, and I don't think we're going to solve the issue of workforce development and workforce capacity for cone collection and other parts of the reforestation process overnight, but a seemingly already kind of good solution is to, you know, empower the community with the knowledge and skills and aspects that uh, so that they can help us and support us on our own because the will is there. Amazing. That sounds like a great involvement of the community. Well, thank you so much, Luis, for coming here today and presenting on this wonderful topic and um, allowing us to be here in this space and learn more about wildfire ecology. So we really appreciate your time. And for those of you who made it today, thank you so much for your support um, and for listening in. All of this information, the PowerPoint and this meeting today will be recorded and it will be shared through email. So for those of you who have registered for the other uh, webinars, those will be shared too. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate your time. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much to our wonderful interpreter, Natalia, who made it possible to have our Spanish line. So thank you again for all of your support. Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>